back to Genesis 47. I've entitled the message for tonight, <clears throat> Jacob Blesses Pharaoh. And that ought to get our attention. Pharaoh is, at that time, the most powerful man in the world. Jacob is insignificant by worldly standards. And we have this insignificant man, by worldly standards, blessing the most powerful man in the world. And you can almost see, see Pharaoh thinking or even saying, I don't need your blessing. You need mine. I don't need your favor. You need mine. But let me remind you of this scripture. Without all contradiction. This is not up for, contradic for controversy. Without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. <clears throat> Pharaoh the less is blessed of Jacob the better. Now, that's fact. How can it be? How is this? A scripture that I quote frequently and think about frequently is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Who maketh thee to differ? Who made Jacob to differ from Pharaoh? What do you have that you didn't receive? Now, Jacob differed from Pharaoh the same way every believer differs from an unbeliever. Here's the difference. God. Here's the difference. Christ. Here's the difference. The Holy Spirit. God the Father made the believer to differ in eternal election when he chose the believer before the foundation of the world. God the Son made the difference when he died for that individual and put away their sins. That other person who is an unbeliever, he didn't pay for their sins. God the Holy Spirit makes the difference in regeneration when he gave them the new birth. Now, the message of false Christianity, and I'm calling it that, false Christianity. There's no saving benefits in false Christianity. All there is is damnation. And I'm not saying that harshly, but I'm saying that believing this with all my heart. False Christianity makes man make the difference. God loves everybody the same. Christ died for everybody the same. God the Holy Spirit calls all men the same. But as to whether or not you're saved, it's not God making the difference. It's you making the difference by you accepting Jesus or receiving Jesus where the other person did not. Now, if that's true, salvation is dependent upon man. And that would be a denial of what we just read in Jonah chapter 2. Salvation is of the Lord. Not of man, not of his work, salvation is of the Lord. I like what somebody said, even a fish spit out, somebody would believe that. Salvation is of the Lord. But let's not forget, the believer does differ greatly from the unbeliever. Let me repeat that. The believer does differ greatly from the unbeliever. And this difference is not found in the way they are by nature. Paul said we were by nature children of wrath, even as others. By nature, there's no difference between Pharaoh and Jacob. They were born equally sinful. 
born of Adam. All have sinned. There's no difference. I love the way Paul says in Romans 3.23, there's no difference. You take everybody in this room, different backgrounds, different education, different opportunities. There's a big difference in people. In God's sight, there is no difference. No difference. No difference between me and you. You take the most immoral man alive and you take the most moral man alive, humanly speaking. No difference. You believe that? No difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's a glorious definition of what sin is. Anything that comes short of God's glory is sin. And there's just no difference between men naturally. But by grace, there is an infinite difference. The natural man, the man is not spiritual. The man has not been born of the Spirit. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither indeed can he know them. He lacks the ability to know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, Pharaoh was a natural man. Jacob and every other believer is what Peter called a partaker of the divine nature. Now, I want you to think of that language. 2 Peter 1.4. If you're a believer, oh, the difference between you and an unbeliever. God made the difference. But what a difference there is. You've been made a partaker of the divine nature. Born of God. You see, Jacob loved God. Pharaoh didn't. Jacob was born of God. Pharaoh wasn't. Jacob had hope. Pharaoh didn't. Jacob was justified. Pharaoh was in his sins. Jacob was poor in spirit. Pharaoh was proud in spirit. Jacob mourned over his sin. Pharaoh was a stranger to that. Jacob was meek before God. Pharaoh wasn't. Jacob hungered and thirsted after righteousness. Pharaoh didn't. Jacob was pure in heart. Pharaoh wasn't. Jacob was a merciful man. Pharaoh wasn't. Jacob was a peacemaker. Pharaoh wasn't. Jacob was persecuted for righteousness sake. Pharaoh wasn't. You see, there is a vast difference between a believer and an unbeliever. You could never say of Pharaoh that he was foreknown by God, whom he did foreknow. You could say that of Jacob. Jacob was predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You can't say that of Pharaoh. Jacob was called by God. Pharaoh wasn't. Jacob was justified. Pharaoh wasn't. Jacob was glorified. Pharaoh wasn't. What a difference. Can you see how it was the greater that blessed the lesser when Jacob blessed Pharaoh? Not by nature. Not by nature. There's no difference between any of us and every one of us that has any light no, we don't have the right to look down our nose at anybody under any circumstance. We don't. There's no difference by nature. But what a difference grace has made. Who made you to differ from another? God did. What do you have that you didn't receive? Everything you have, you received it. Well, let's, um, somebody says, well, what if 
Pharaoh was a believer. Well, maybe he was. <laughs> um, Nebuchadnezzar was a believer, wasn't he? God used Daniel to make himself known to Nebuchadnezzar and maybe through uh, Joseph's influence, Pharaoh heard the gospel. You know, you know Pharaoh loved Joseph. He had great respect for Joseph because of all the things Joseph had done for Israel. Maybe Pharaoh was a believer. You know, the, there was another king. Uh, there's a king, Exodus begins, there arose another king who knew not Joseph. Pharaoh did. Now, I love this statement, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And I love the way, um, and it was not disrespect on his part, but if you look at the last verse of the passage I read, he blessed him again. He blessed him. And we don't read where he asked Pharaoh permission to leave. <laughs> it just says he went out from him after he blessed him. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Verse 8. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? There was respect for age. And there should be respect for age. How old art thou? Perhaps Jacob looked like a really old man. I would say he did. He'd been through a lot. And we know he was 130 years old at this time. That's pretty old. But, Jay, but Pharaoh looked at him, and I think he said this with respect. He saw this man who, um, he was the father of the man who delivered all of Egypt, and he said, how old art thou? <clears throat> Jacob's answer. Verse 9, and Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. And have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Now the first thing that I would notice about Jacob's answer, our life is measured in days. Just days. Boast not of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Our life is measured in days. You know, it wasn't very long ago that I was a teenager. And I can remember it so well. I was a teenager. Had all my life before me. And now I'm on the downhill slide. The days. David said in Psalm 39, verses 4 and 5, Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days. What it is. That I might know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, the distance from here to here. And my age is as nothing before thee. Surely, Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Moses said in Psalm 90, Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Paul said, Redeem the time. You know what that means? Make the most of every day. Make the most of every minute, for the days are evil. Now, your life and my life are measured in days. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little while and passes away. I always think it's interesting when people talk about wanting to leave a legacy. Let me tell you how much of a legacy you're going to leave. Stick your thumb in the water and pull it back out. That's it. 
And in not too long, nobody will remember your name. If the earth lasts long enough, a couple of generations, oh, I, I hope um, the people that knew me will remember me, but they'll die. Nobody else will. A vapor. Teach me to number my days. And notice he calls his life a pilgrimage. And we're going to get back to that in a moment. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage. You know, every believer is a stranger and a pilgrim. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. And I really believe that. This world is not my home. Now, he says, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Now, he's talking about Isaac and Abraham. Abraham lived what? 175 years. Isaac lived 180 years. He didn't reach their age, but I don't think that's really what he's talking about. I think Jacob's saying, I'm not the man they were. I'm not the man they were. Are there people you could say that about? Jacob certainly could. I'm not the man they were. Few and evil have been the days of the years of this brief life of mine. Now, I want us to consider his assessment of his life. Come around sometime. How you doing? Great. Great. Couldn't be better. If it could be better, I, I, I don't know how I could take it. I, I'm doing so wonderful, great. And when people, now when people ask you how you're doing, say fine. Don't tell them um, all the other stuff. You just say fine, fine. You know, I, I, um, but when somebody starts talking about how wonderful and great it is what they're doing, they're trying to make you understand that your life's not as good as theirs. Things are going great for me. I, you know, I'm, I'm thankful. But that's not the way... Jacob answered, is it? Jacob gave, a, gave an accurate assessment of his life when he said, few and evil have been the days of the years of my pilgrimage here on earth. Few, life doesn't last long. Life does not last long. Life is brief. Few and evil. And that word evil is evil. Now that word actually carries with it two connotations. First, calamitous. One calamity after another. One trouble after another. This is my life, one calamity after another. Now you think of Jacob's life. His father showed so much preference to Esau over him. And you can imagine all the problems that created in his life. His brother hated him and wanted to kill him. And he had to run away. And he was in a land of exile for 20 years. That's where he found his two wives and two concubines. And he had a father-in-law named Laban that ripped him off 10 times. What a difficult life this man had. In his family, he had so much problems from his children. There was rape. There was murder. There was one scandal after another in his own family. He actually said to his boys, you've made me to stink 
among the inhabitants of the land. He was afraid for his life because of the conduct and the action of his kids. You can imagine what conflict there was between his wives. He thought Joseph, his favorite son, was killed by a wild beast, and he believed that for 22 years. You think of his troubles and his sons going down to Egypt. He was afraid for Benjamin, his other favorite son, after his first favorite son he thought was gone. You think of him losing Simeon and Simeon being locked up. His life was a series of very difficult trials. Man that's born of woman is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. And Joseph didn't try to hide any of that. I mean, Jacob didn't try to hide any of that. He said to Pharaoh when Pharaoh asked him of his life, Few and evil have been the days of the years of my pilgrimage. I read where a very pessimistic philosopher, or realistic, if you, depending on your point of view, but he made this statement the best thing that could ever happen to any man is to have never been born. And the next best thing is to die early. I kind of laughed at that. Um, but he certainly was looking at things from a very bleak point of view. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my pilgrimage here on earth. Aren't you thankful? The scripture says, if there's evil in the city, hath not the Lord done it? Whatever calamity it is, he's in control of. And we have that blessed comfort. But evil also means wicked, evil, bad, sinful. It's the word used in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man, that's the exact same word. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil nonstop, continually. Now I'm asking myself and I'm asking you, do you believe that about yourself? That every imagination of the thoughts of your heart is only evil, nonstop. Now, the only way that you can really believe that is if you've been born of God. Because the only person that recognizes sinfulness is a person who's been born from God. The natural man has no true concept of sin. He thinks sin is, if I do this and keep from doing that, I can keep from sin. And they don't have a concept that my very nature is evil. And every imagination of the thought of my heart is only evil continually. It takes, listen to me, it takes a holy nature to see that. That's a blessing of his grace. You see, when you see that about yourself, you sure enough know that the only hope you have is if you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ as your personal righteousness before God. And you're clinging on to that. Your only hope is the, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. It's a blessing in that sense. You know not to look to yourself if you believe that every imagination of the thoughts of your heart is only evil continually. You, you can't look to yourself. You only look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the way every believer feels and only the believer feels this way about themselves. No unbeliever feels that way about themselves. Oh, they may be bad, but they think they have the potential. If the circumstances are right and if my ducks are in a row, I could be... A believer knows this about himself. Because he's been given a holy nature. And it's only the holy nature that recognizes the sinful nature. And this is what they, or this is what Jacob says about himself. Few and evil have been 
the days of the years of the life of my pilgrimage. Now, I know that about myself, and I also know the joy and peace of believing. The joy and peace of believing. Believing what? That Christ is all in my salvation. There's such joy in that. There's such peace in that. There's such rest in that. Notice how Jacob spake of his life as a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage. Just like my father Isaac and my grandfather Abraham, a pilgrimage. Now the word means a sojourning, just passing through. The world really is not my home. I'm not comfortable here. You know, when I see people who are believers, who profess to be believers, and they seem to be more comfortable in the world than they are among the people of God, it always bothers me. Um... This world and the ways of this world is not my home. Peter said, as strangers and pilgrims. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now, stranger means you're not from here. You're foreigner. You're not from here. The Lord said with regard to all his people... They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. <clears throat> he said to one group of people, you're of your father, the devil. That's where you're from. And the lust of your father, you will do. He that's of God Heareth God's words. Now that's the mark of being of God. He that's of God heareth God's words. You therefore hear them not because you're not of God. The Lord said that to these people. Here's where every believer is from. You all ask people all the time, where are you from? And if somebody asks me where I'm from, I'll say Ashland, Kentucky, or first home was in Huntington. But here's where I'm really from. Of him are you in Christ Jesus. That's where I'm from. Of him are you in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, before the foundation of the world. You know, I was in Christ before time began. That's where I'm from, in Christ. I want to say this reverently, but my dress right now is in Christ. And the only place I ever want to be found is in Christ, to where all God sees is his son, and I'm in Christ. Him And truly, this world is not my home. I'm passing through, longing for my heavenly home. We're to treat this world like a hotel room. Now, I like a nice hotel room. You know, when I was young, Lynn can testify this, we'd stop at six, seven hotels looking for the cheapest one. And um, uh, we got to the point to find out when you pay the cheapest you get the cheapest one too I mean they're dirty they're they, you know you're, and Lynn put a stop to that and um, I'm glad she did but um, let's say it is a nice hotel room nice hotel room well are you going to invest a bunch of money in it are you going to invest a bunch of time in it are you going to buy new pictures to put up in it and get it? no you're just there for a day you're just passing through now, I love a good hotel room. I don't like a dirty one. I love a good hotel room, but I'm not going to invest much time in it. I'm not going to, I'm just going to be there for a little while. And with regard to this earth, me and you are just going to be here for a little while. Pilgrims passing 
through. Now, the world has its blessings like a nice hotel room, but uh, we won't be there very long. We're passing through as pilgrims. Now, I want to uh, end this message with 1 Peter chapter 1 because Peter addresses pilgrims. This is the first way he addresses believers. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm just going to read this passage of Scripture and make a few comments. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers. You ever notice that? The first thing he calls God's people are strangers, foreigners. You're not from here. You're in a hotel room, but this is not your home. Strangers. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect. <laughs> you know that, I love that. Elect. You know, that's just the way the early church spake. Look at the, the last verses of this book in chapter 5. Verse 13. The church that's in Babylon elected together with you salute you. I mean, that's just the way they talked. That's the way they thought. And if you would have said, well, I don't believe in election, they'd say, what? Get out. I don't You've got problems. You've got problems. Um, elect. I love election, don't you? It glorifies God. It gives God all the glory. It makes God to be God. Election is God being God. Let's never, it's not just a doctrine to be argued over. It's God being God. It's not up for debate. I'm not going to debate this. This is, this is just the very truth of God. And like I said, in the early church, this was conversational. The church that has a Babylon elected together. John writes to the elect lady. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. You see how this was just so woven in their thinking. Elect. Back to our, in 1 Peter 1. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Somebody says, well, that tells you what election is. God foreknew you'd believe. Whom, not what, whom he did foreknow. Whom he did for love. Elect according to that saving love, the knowledge of God to you. To think that God knows me. He knows me. He foreknew me. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God's not a time traveler. He doesn't look through the telescope of time and say, well, that, I see that one's going to believe there. For, no, I'm a, no, no. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. Paul said to the Thessalonians, we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you unto salvation through, through sanctification of the Spirit. This is the saving, regenerating work of God the Holy Spirit. And belief of the truth. What is the evidence of sanctification of the Spirit? Belief of the truth. What is the cause of belief of the truth? Sanctification of the Spirit. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I've heard preachers use this and say, you see, 
your elect unto obedience. Now, I want to be obedient. Every believer desires obedience. I want to be obedient to my Lord. But am I going to put my obedience up beside the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ? This is talking about the obedience of Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. Now, let me show you that. Uh, hold your finger. I said I wouldn't go anywhere, but I'm going to. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you don't have a King James Version, it might not read this way, and that's why if I were you, I'd get a King James Version. But look what it says in verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought is to be subject to the obedience of Jesus Christ. The obedience of and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what we're elect unto. Sanctification of the Spirit makes us see that my salvation is the obedience, and every thought is to be brought into subjection to that. Any thought that you have that uh, puts that into question, get rid of it. Every thought is to be brought into subjection to the obedience of and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace. Back to our text. Grace unto you. And peace be multiplied. What peace we have from salvation by grace. That's the only place there is peace. Is his grace. Blessed. Remember he's speaking to the strangers. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Don't ever uh, even think without also thinking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was delivered for our offenses and he was raised again for our justification. And the gospel is seen, the character of God is seen in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's begotten us again into a lively hope, a living hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And here's what that means. When Christ was raised from the dead, God said concerning him and everybody he represented, I'm completely satisfied. I'm not looking for anything else. To an inheritance, verse 4. To an inheritance. You've got a vast inheritance. An indescribable inheritance. Incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away Reserved. You know, I've got a reservation. My name. Reserved in heaven for you who are kept. Don't miss that. You who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I love when Paul said, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Wherein you greatly rejoice, in everything I've said, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. That could be the temptation to sin. Boy, when you're, when you're tempted to sin, it makes you heavy, doesn't it? It's a grievous thing. Or it could be the trials, the temptations God has brought your way. And here's why. 
you have this heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Now I want you to think about that. You've never seen Jesus Christ. And you love him better than you love anybody else. And you've never seen him. Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now that is the promise to the strangers that he is written to. I want to be a stranger, don't you? I want this world to, like I said, I appreciate a good hotel room. I do. But I want this world to be to me nothing more than a hotel room. That I'm staying here for just a little while. I'm not investing myself in a hotel room. May the Lord bless this to his glory and our good. Let's pray together. Lord, how we thank you that you made us to differ by your grace. And Lord, may we manifest that difference by poverty of spirit, by mourning, by meekness before you, by hungering and thirsting after your righteousness, with that pure heart that you give, by being merciful, by being a peacemaker. And oh Lord, allow us to be of that number who are persecuted for the righteousness of thy son's sake. Lord, as we face this coming week, we pray for your blessing of grace upon us. We thank you for who you are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.